The Crossroads Chapter 2 It was a while before Mies McAllister's voice echoed in the boys' bathroom. Jamie? Estás aquí? Jamie didn't answer. His pants were still wet and the laughter kept playing in his head. She left without checking the stalls and Jamie made sure his door was locked. Boys came and went for every few minutes, sometimes talking with others, sometimes forgetting to flush or wash their hands. A few even spoke in Spanish. No one noticed Jamie locked in the corner stall. One boy came in a few times, but only to eat chocolate. Even without seeing him, Jamie knew it was the same kid. The crackle of the wrappers, the smell of the chocolate gave him away each time. Chaco Chico, as Jamie began to call him, had just left for the third time when Jamie was about to escape. But a herd of children stomped by outside the bathroom in loud voices, and he lost his nerve. Jamie? Mies McAllister returned. Jamie ignored her. She called again, saying something in English before her shoes squeaked into the boy's bathroom. He lifted his sneakers off the floor so he couldn't, she couldn't see him from under the gap. Her own shoes, hot pink with leopard spots, stopped in front of the stall. Jamie, I know you're in there. He kept silent and still. Any minute she would pick the latch or look under the door. Except she didn't. Judging by her shoes, she leaned against the wall in front of the stalls and crossed her ankles instead. Please come out. It's lunchtime. Aren't you hungry? Yes, he was hungry. Back in the classroom was his new backpack, which had his new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles lunch bag, which had a ham and avocado sandwich, a banana, a bag of salt and vinegar potato chips, a carton of milk. They had gone to hu a huge store the day before that sold everything imaginable, and Tomas had let him and Angela pick out all their favorite foods. His stomach rumbled just thinking about it. So much for being quiet. But that wasn't enough for him to come out. He knew what it was like to be hungry. He'd spent days in near starvation. Skipping one meal was nothing. It would take a lot more than a few funny noises from his stomach to change his mind. Mrs. McAllister seemed to think the same thing and sighed. I can't force you, but I've talked with your teacher. This school has a strict no bullying policy, so no one will say anything to you. A snort came out of Jamie's throat before he could stop it. He knew kids. He knew the way they would, what they would say, whether they wanted to or not. He just wouldn't be able to understand what they said. Mrs. McAllister waited. Maybe she understood what his grunt meant because she sighed after a few minutes. I can't stay. It is, she paused, it is, as if she was trying to remember the Spanish word for what she wanted to say. It's not allowed to me, for me to be in the boys' bathroom. If you want to hang out with me instead, my room is, the left, uh, is to the left outside of the bathrooms, down the hall, and all the way to the end. You'll hear the music. Music? Did this mean Mrs. McAllister taught music? Did kids play music made from dried gourds? he'd seen along the side of the ranch road? Or was it just singing? He was about to ask when Chico Chinko, or uh, Chaco Chico entered. The rappers in his pocket were extra loud this time and Mrs. McAllister excused herself before she got into trouble. Jamie waited for Chaco Chico to leave before pulling out some toilet paper and seeing what kind of sculptures he could make out of the paper. Lots of things, apparently. By making small balls and snakes and licking his fingers to make the paper stick, he ended up with a zoo of animals parading on the floor by the time the toilet paper ran out. And the final bell rang. Now was the time he grabbed his two favorite paper animals, a horse and a dragon, and left his sanctuary, camouflaged in the crowd of kids with no one noticing him. Everyone talked and spe speed walked toward the glass front doors, which weren't locked from the inside. And there, waiting among all his parents, all, all the parents, was Tomas. Jamie rushed to his big brother and almost knocked him over by jumping on him. Hey, good to see you too. Where's your backpack? 
Jamie looked down at his scuffed sneakers and shrugged. I don't know. It was a total lie. He didn't remember where the classroom was. Did you lose it? Jamie shrugged. Tomas sighed and pulled out his phone to check the time. Let's go look for it. Look for it before picking up Angela. I can't afford to get you a new one. Jamie took a step back. He looked down at the state of his pants. They were dark blue from his angle and couldn't, his angle, he couldn't notice the stains. Tomas's hand stayed on his shoulder, pushing him forward. After all these years of working as a cowboy and herding cattle for a living, Tomas didn't seem about to let one 12 year old boy go astray. The teacher was still in the classroom grading papers. Jamie's backpack lay slumped on the seat. Jamie dug his heels, ready to bolt, but Tomas pushed him in. Hi, I'm Tom Rivera, Jamie's brother, Tomas told the teacher in English. As they talked, both of them kept looking his way. He didn't need to understand the words to know they were talking about him. They ended their talk with a handshake, and Tomas motioned with his head for them to leave. Jamie didn't need to be told twice. With his backpack strapped on and the two toilet paper creatures still in his hand, he was out of the classroom before Tomas. They were almost at the truck when Tomas spoke up. Next time you need to go to the bathroom, just write your name on the right-hand corner of the board, and you're excused. Really? That simple? Then why hadn't he said so? Why did she have to use fancy words like sign out? How hard was it to beckon him to the board, have him write his name, and then point to the door? He was smart. He would have gotten it. Instead, she had practically ignored him as he waved vaguely in the board's direction. Or as she waved vaguely in the board's direction. Weren't teachers supposed to know how to explain things so kids could understand? He ate his sandwich while they drove to get Angela. The avocado had gone brown, but it still tasted pretty good. Maybe a squeeze of lemon would help next time. He made the, wait. What do you mean, next time? I have to go back, Jamie gasped. Tomorrow, education is a good thing, Tomas said. You didn't finish school, Jamie pointed out. I did, Tomas reassured him. Once I got there, I studied for my certificate. But back home, lots of kids my age don't go to school. Jamie reminded him, home, what he wouldn't give to be back there, where everything was familiar. That's because there is no free transportation to get them to school. Uniforms, books, and school supplies cost too much, and parents need their kids to start work instead. In this country, kids are required by law to go to school. Well, maybe I don't want to be in this country. The truck bumped and banged as Tomas pulled over and slammed on the emergency brake. The truck leaned dangerously toward the ditch on the right. Tomas unclipped his seatbelt to turn and glare at Jamie. Gravity and surprise pushed Jamie against the passenger door. He couldn't remember ever seeing his brother so angry and scared. Don't even joke about that. I Gangs killed Magwell, our own cousin. And they wanted you to take his place and Angela to be there. Jamie did his best not to have to hear Tomas say the words. He knew what would have happened to him. As much as being a drug dealer turned his insides, it would have been a million times worse for Angela. I don't want to join the Alphas. Jamie defended himself as Tomas continued talking about what their parents had gone through to let them hear safely. But I don't want to be here either. Well, maybe you'll get your wish. Do you know what's going on in the news? Every day it seems like there's a statement about immigrants and who should be allowed to stay in the country. There's talk of a massive wall and deporting all of us. But you have papers, a work visa, Jamie frowned. He and Angela didn't. Do you think that's going to make a difference? Officials capture first and let lawyers answer later. If you can afford a lawyer, and we can't. So where does that leave us? Back in Guatemala. 
me unable to get a job that pays enough to survive and you and Angela facing what you ran away from, making everything we've all been through for nothing. Jamie ran a thorough, ran a hand through his hair. He gelled perfectly that morning, not looking at his brother. Outside the window, the nothingness of the scarce vegetation seemed to mock him. I know it's rough to hear the truth, but you're here to stay. So you, tomorrow, go to school. Tomas left no space for arguing as he popped the emergency brake and pulled the truck back on the road. They drove up in front of Angela's school, and like Jamie, she came running to them. But unlike Jamie, she not only had her backpack, she also had a huge smile on her face. Guess what, Angela? Jumped back in, into the truck, squishing Jamie, who hadn't scooted over in time. You know how I've always wanted to do more acting than the, nat than the nativity play? Well, they're putting on this play called The Sound of Music, and my English is good enough that the drama teacher said I could be in it. I'll just be one of the ladies in the crowd, like a nun or a party goer, but I'll be in a lot of scenes, and there is a chance I might even have some be given some lines. Rehearsals are Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, so I'm actually missing today. Your school is about an hour and a half there and back. Tomas shook his head, no. I can't take that much time off work to pick you up from rehearsals three times a week. I'm only doing it today since it's your first day. Starting tomorrow, you two have to ride the bus. Jamie could feel the blood draining from his face at the mention of the bus. Great, more kids to have fun of him. But Angela either didn't know bus horror stories or had selective hearing and ignored the bus slip. I'm sure I can find someone to bring me back to the ranch after practice. One of the boys already said he could after Wednesday's rehearsal. I just need you to sign permission form. Is it okay, right? Does it cost anything to be in the play, Tomas asked. We're fundraising to cover the costs. If you can find rides and you want to, Tomas shrugged, as if it weren't his decision to make. Tia, Angela's mama, would have, have asked a lot more questions and gone to school to personally meet the drama teacher and the person driving her home, and then would have made Angela promise that she still had to maintain good grades before letting her be part of the play. Jamie's mama would have done the same. I really, really do. She reached over, ja over Jamie to try and hug Tomas. Her arms just grazed his shoulders, squishing Jamie and his two paper critters in the process. Let us know when the shows are and will come, Tomas said, while taking one hand off the steering wheel to reach over J Jamie to pat her knee. And if they're going to film it, be sure to put us down for a DVD to send to your parents. Jamie was about to inform Tomas and Angela's family sold Jamie was about to inform Tomas that Angela's family sold the TV to help pay for their passage, but let Angela lunged once more to hug Tomas. As she returned her, to her side, her nose scrunched up. Why does it smell like pee in here? From the main highway, they turned onto a dirt road, went through three cattle guards, and drove for about 20 minutes more. All the land around them belonged to Mista George from the highway to the mountain in the distance that was once a volcano and beyond. Jamie hadn't seen the entire property, but Tomas said it took a few hours by car to get from one end to the other. All that land for a few thousand head of cattle and a few humans. It was like living in a Western movie in all and any minute Zorro would come riding through. Coming down a small hill, a gust of desert wind blew a huge cloud of dust temporarily blocking the big house view. Jamie still hadn't even met Mista George, who was away with his wife visiting their new grandchild. From what Tomas said, Mr. George was a strict but fair man. He let Tomas drive his old truck and live rent-free in one of the trailers near the big house. And even then, he paid Tomas an honest wage. 
But in exchange, Mr. George expected hard work and dedication. They drove up to their trailer just as another cloud of dust rose from the west. Jamie squinted into the sun to watch the cattle coming closer. A lone cowboy rode his gray Appaloosa behind them, and four dogs helped herd the cattle into the large corral. Well, three dogs herded the cattle, while the fourth created her own dust ball dashing to the truck. Vida! Jamie greeted their one-eared brown and white mutt, who returned the salutation with kisses as if she hadn't known whether she would ever see them again. Jamie knew how she felt. After Angela's boyfriend had found the dog half-drowned and torn apart from a dog-fighting fight ring in Mexico, Angela had literally stitched her back to life. Now Angela's boyfriend was gone and Vita was all they had left of those friends they had made along their journey. It had been hard to leave behind that morning, leave her behind that morning, but the cowboy, Don, promised he would take good care of her. And it looked like he had. The ranch hand, Quinto, latched the corral shut once Don as ensured the last cow was secure. The older man said a few words to the ranch hand before turning his Appaloosa on his hindquarters and trotting over to Jamie and his family in front of their trailer. According to Tomas, Tom, or sorry, Don had worked there since before Jesus and knew the ranch better than anyone. Don, Don's wife, Donna Chichi, had been Mr. George's nanny when the owner was little. And now, Mr. George had grandkids of his own. Storm's coming, Don said in a way of barely moving his lips. He was a desert man from Mexico, with a face so worn and darkened by the sun, Jamie wondered if it had stiffened like old leather, too many expressions could cause it to crack. If the old cowboy ever had the time to sit for a portrait on his horse, of course, Jamie would love to sketch out his face in, char in charcoal. Not that he had any charcoals, but still, and capture the depth on the page. Tonight, Tomas looked at the blue sky, not a cloud in sight. Don shifted his worn straw cowboy hat and grunted his response. Tomas looked back at the brown cows with white faces in the corral. Most were hanging around, waiting to see if they would ever get fed while a few were checking out their three-sided shelter. Is that all of them? Last of the cows, till the calves come. Tomas headed to the corral. Don watched him for a second, but didn't urge his gelding to follow. Why is Tomas upset? Aren't calves a good thing? Angela asked. Don took his time to turn back to them. I bet we'll have at least four cows in labor tonight, right in the middle of the storm. They always pick the worst weather to calve. It's a survival thing. Few predators out when the weather is bad. Are you sure it'll be bad? Jamie looked again at the sky. He still couldn't get over how blue it was out there. No pollution, no smoke. It was like someone spilled the blue paint bucket and forgot to mop it up. I'm guessing about a foot of snow. Snow in April? Both Jamie and Angela squealed. Yeah, weather here in New Mexico always does what it wants, Don said with a groan. Tomas and I will be up all night tending the cows, delivering in the freezing weather. Last year, we lost three calves and one cow during a spring storm. And Mr. George will be very upset if it happens again. This time, Don did nudge his gelding toward the barn near the corral. From over his shoulder, he called out, that's a nice dog you got there. Quick to learn. Jamie smiled as he scratched Vita's one ear and got a kiss back. Finally, some good news for the day. Snow.